People who've studied Spanish or French and other languages uh, that have genders uh, will be familiar with some nouns are feminine, some nouns are masculine. So for example, in Spanish, la casa, feminine, um, el drama, um, a play, a drama, would be masculine. And in Latin, we have masculine nouns, feminine nouns, and neuter nouns. Now we're looking at the first declension, and in this video we're looking at first declension nouns in the singular, and all but a few of the first declension nouns are feminine, so the large majority are feminine. Uh, an example of a masculine noun uh, in the first declension is nauta, uh, sailor. It's a masculine noun, though of course uh, women can be sailors. The Latin word for prophet, profeta, in the same category. So we do have some words in the Gospels that are first declension nouns um, that are masculine, but the vast majority of first declension nouns are feminine. Let's look at some first declension nouns that we find in the Gospels. Ancilla, hand, handmaid, maid servant. Uh, we have the word ancillary, right? So ancil usually we hear this in ancillary funds. So funds that are kind of alongside, sort of helping funds, if that's a, a good way of thinking of it. So I think conceptually you can see how those kinds of funds, ancillary funds that are, that are there to provide a little extra help, that's kind of like, you know, the handmaid of money, maybe. Anima, mind, soul. Uh, the word animal, right? Um, to be animated, right, is to be full of life. Cathedra, our word cathedral comes from that. In Latin it means chair, seat, or pulpit. The cathedral in the traditional sense is the place where the bishop is seated. The seat of the bishop is in the cathedral. So that's, um, that's sort of the history of that word. Um, although cathedral for us now doesn't necessarily mean where the bishop is sitting. Okay, causa, well it means cause, case, you can see the clear relation to cause. Senna, meal, banquet. I can't think of an English word right now related to cena, although there may be one, but certainly in Spanish, right, la cena, uh, dinner. Uh, corona, corona in Spanish, crown. Um, and uh, we do have the word coronate when a person um, becomes a king or a queen, that person is coronated, that is, puts on the crown. So that's a word that exists in English from Latin. Doctrina, uh, means doctrine, pretty clear uh, relationship there. Uh, philia, daughter. We do have a fairly unusual word in English, a uh, filial. Usually we hear this in relation to filial responsibility, the, the responsibility of a child to a parent. Okay, that's not very common, but it does exist in English. Ora, or in Spanish should be ora. You can see the clear connection between Spanish and Latin, hour, and you can see how, how close even ora and hour are, so hour clearly uh, comes from the Latin word lacrima, tear. We do have the word in uh, English lacrimose, we might refer to a lacrimose event, a, a tearful event. Luna, of course it's the exact same word in Spanish, la luna, right? In English we say lunatic, right? This old, this old idea that uh, the moon affects people and that a person who is crazy might be overly affected by the moon. I think that's, that's the idea. So except for Senna up there, each of those words um, exists in English just in a slightly different form. And there might even be something in English from Senna that I just can't think of right now. Okay, then we have Mensa. And I'm not able, off the top of my head, to think of a word um, in English that is related to that Latin word. There probably is one, but I can't think of it right now. Uh, parabola, clearly related to parable. Propheta, pretty obvious, prophet. Scriptura, pretty obvious, scripture. Spina, meaning thorn, but our word spine, the English word spine, uh, can be traced back to this Latin word spina. Stellar 
a Latin word for star, I'm sorry, stella, a Latin word for star, our word stellar comes from it. Uh, synagoga, synagogue, pretty clear. Terra, earth, ground, terrestrial. Um, let me see, terrain, right? So those words, uh, those English words are related back to that Latin word. Turba means crowd multitude. We could think of a crowd as being turbulent, for example. So turbulent would be related to turba. Via, way, path, road, highway. And we use that word in English. We could say, oh, well, you can get to such and such place via such and such street. Via, via, right? Vita, life, eternal life. Vita is in vital. What are your vital signs? What are your signs of life? vitamin, etc. So in these two lists that we have, all but two of the words, I'm able with ease to think of English words that come from them, the exceptions being senna, although there is certainly uh, a, a Spanish word related to that, mensa, I'm not able to think of something immediately off the top of my head. The, all of the others, pretty straightforward, pretty clear. So people who say that Latin is dead, well, okay, it's true, maybe not very many people in the world actually speak Latin, but if you speak English, you're using Latin words all the time. And of course, if you speak Spanish or French, you're just speaking, you're speaking dialects of Latin. In the Gospels, we also have names and places that are in the first declension. Bethsaida, pretty straightforward, Maria, Martha, okay? And those, uh, those uh, names and places uh, are also then in the first declension. Let's look at some examples, okay? Now up top, we have um, our sample, let's see, let me, yeah, okay, up top, we have our scheme there, so using philia, right, in the nominative case, and remember we discussed in the, in the, the previous vid video, the nominative case, uh, this tells us who or what is doing the action of the verb, the genitive case has to do with possession. The dative case has to do with indirect object. The accusative case has to do with direct object. And then the ablative case tells us how the action of a verb is getting done. Okay, well, let's work it out. Baptizo in agua. Okay, baptizo, we've seen that before. First conjugation verb, baptizare, ends with an O, therefore I baptize. I baptize in nice Latin preposition, which we have in English. What do I baptize in? I baptize in agua, right? Now, a good rule of thumb is that if you have a noun that is preceded by a preposition, for example, in, then uh, we're looking at the ablative case, okay? That's not always going to be the case, right? There are other, other examples or there are other, other situations, and I think we'll see one later here. But often, if you have a noun preceded by a preposition, it's going to be in the ablative case. So, baptizo. Well, I baptize. Well, okay, now the noun, the, I'm sorry, the, um, the declension of the noun tells, gives me a little bit of information about how the action of that verb is being carried out. How do I baptize? I baptize in water. And so, agua there, or aqua, is in the ablative case. Vitam aeternam possidebo. Possidebo, possidere, uh, possidere is the verb, okay? To possess. And then if you look over in the vocabulary, it says, I will possess. So we have a verb, which is in, in this case is in the future, in the future tense, okay? So I will possess. What will I possess? I will possess vitam aeternam, that is, I will possess eternal life. Vitam, you look at the am ending there, that's the accusative case. Why the accusative case? Because the accusative has to do with direct action. I'm going to possess something. What am I going to possess? Vitam. I'm going to possess life. And so think of vitam as the thing that is being touched first as a result of the action of the verb. Right? So that, that um, Latin noun vita is receiving the action of being possessed. Therefore, it's in the accusative case. And then we have the adjective that follows, I turn on, 
which is also in the accusative case, but we're not focusing on adjectives right now. The main thing to notice right now is that VTOM is in the accusative case because it is receiving the action of possession. Three, venet in synagogam, right? So in this case, venet, uh, venet he came, right? In, into synagogam, okay? Now you'll notice in number one, in there, uh, um, is related to the ablative case, right? I baptize in water. So I'm kind of within something, right? I'm in the water and I'm baptizing in the water. In number three, in really should be translated as into, all right? So he came into the synagogue. And so the synagogue is receiving the action of being walked into. And so synagogam, that's the accusative case. Four, magnificat anima mea dominum. Okay, dominum, the Lord. Magnificat, uh, that's the third person singular. Magnificare, right? Magnificare, to magnify, to glorify. And remember that if you have a T at the end, just a T at the end of a first conjugation verb, then that means he, she, or it magnifies. Magnificat anima mea. Anima, remember, means soul. Mea, my. My soul magnifies dominum, the Lord. Okay? So magnificare, that's a first conjugation verb. But then look at anima, right? Anima mea uh, magnificat dominum, and you can flip the words around. Anima is in the nominative case. Why is this a nominative case? Well, because we have the verb magnificat. He, she, it magnifies. But what magnifies? Who or what magnifies? Well, the soul, this person's soul is magnifying. So anima is doing the action of the verb, therefore it's nominative case. Five. Sepit in synagoga docere. Sepit in synagoga docere. Docere, second, second conjugation verb, um, to teach. Sepit, he began, or he, she, it began, but we know from the context. He began, sepit docere, okay? So he began to teach. So we have a verb, or we have two verbs, he began, but then docere, to teach. So, the, but then we have a noun, synagoga. And synagoga could be nominative or it could be ablative. Well, but it can't be nominative though, because let me see, the synagogue begins to teach. That doesn't make any sense, right? And then plus you have the preposition in. So sepit in synagoga. Look again at number one. Baptizo in agua. I teach, or I'm sorry, I baptize in water. Number five, Sepet, he began in synagogue, in the synagogue, to teach, right? So notice number three, venet in synagogam, right? He's walking into the synagogue, in number, and therefore it's accusative because the synagogue is receiving the action of being walked into. But now we're already inside the synagogue, and now in number five, he began to teach while he was in the synagogue, ablative case, docere, the verb to teach, in synagogue tells us a little bit about how that verb is being carried out, how the action of that verb is being carried out. That's the ablative case. Six, mites possidebunt teram. Mites, poor people, possidebunt, same verb as possidebo up in number two, but look, at the, it's the NT, right, so they, they will, who will? The poor will possess, what will they possess? Teram, earth. Now the noun, of course, we go back here. The noun is terra, fourth in the bottom. The noun is terra, earth. But here the ending, oops, here the ending is am. Why is it am? Because it's accusative case, why? Because the earth is receiving the action of being possessed by the poor. The poor will possess something. What will they possess? The earth. 
So the earth is receiving that action, therefore it's the direct object of the action of, um, what's the English word, in terms of possessing, right? So the earth is receiving the action of being possessed, therefore it's in the accusative case. Number seven, quid david homo pro anima sua, right? What will a man give for his soul? What will a man give for his soul? Homo, man, david, uh, to give, right? What will a man give for pro anima sua? Pro for sua, meaning his, right? What will a man give for his soul? The noun we're looking at is anima, pro anima. In exchange for the soul, what will a person give? I think the best way to, to look at this one is that we have the preposition preceding the noun in this case, right? And pro, when you have the preposition pro in front of a noun, we're going to want to look for the ablative, okay? Now we have two possibilities. Anima, it could be nominative because it just ends with an A. It could be nominative or it could be ablative. But if you try to work it out with the nominative, it doesn't really make sense. If we want anima to be doing the action of the verb of the verb davit, um, it just doesn't doesn't really make sense. And if you don't immediately see why it doesn't make sense, maybe a, a teacher can help you out. But as I'm looking at it, I'm just saying no, it can't be nominative because I don't see how anima could be doing could be doing uh, the work of the verb, right? Plus, we have the preposition pro. And so if we see a noun after pro, we should look for the ablative case, okay? So, quid david homo pro anima sua. So in, ex in, in, we have the action of giving, right? And I, this one is honestly, it is a little bit hard to explain. I think, that, I think the best way, I think that what I would just say here, the main thing to point out is if you're trying to decide is it nominative, is it ablative, just work with it and say, well, you know, could it be anima? Is it possible that anima is doing the action of David? It seems really unlikely because we have that other noun, homo, there. Um, and, then, and then anima is preceded by the preposition pro, right? So I think in that case, in that case it's pretty clear that it is in the ablative case. Number eight, uh, ambulabat super Aguam, ambulava, ambulare, that's a nice first conjugation verb, ambulare. To be ambulatory means you can walk around. Ambulabat, that's the imperfect past. We'll talk about that later. Ambulabat, he was walking. Super, that is over or on aquam. Look up at number one, baptizo in aqua, ablative case. I baptize in aqua in the water. But now I'm walking on the water, right? And the water is receiving the action of being walked on. And so aquam accusative case. Propheta est, okay? Est just means uh, propheta est as in is, you know, he is a prophet. Or if it's feminine, because it can be feminine, we know from the context it's he, but it can be feminine. She is a prophet. So we have the verb est, okay? And then, uh, but we need to know, well, who is, who's, who or what is esting, right? Who or what is being? Because this is from the verb sum, to be. And, you know, who, who is in that state of being, right? And it's propheta, right? Um, again, it's a little bit hard for me to, to explain, but there really isn't another possibility here. If you look at it, the ablative just doesn't work, right? So you have the verb to be, and who's doing the action of the being, or who or what is doing the action of the being? Propheta. He is a prophet, right? Number 10, ego sum via et vita. Same thing here. We, here we have sum, uh, so I am. Then we have ego sum. You don't have to have the ego there, what, because ego means I. Sum means I am. So it's, this is kind of a way to emphasize the point. I am, 
All right. What am I? I am the vita. I am the via et vita. Ego sum. I am via et vita. Okay. Now remember, in Latin, there there are no articles. Article being the or a. They don't exist in Latin, so in English we have to put them in. Ego sum. I am the way and the life. Once again, we have a verb sum. I am. Well, what or who is doing the action of sum? Well, ego, I am, I am doing that, right? But what, what is this essence of being, right? What is related to this essence of being, to this, this action of being? Well, what's related to this action of being is what I am. I am the way, via, and I am the life. So I understand with that one, with the previous one, number nine, my explanations may not have been perfectly clear. Um, some of these things are, are a little bit hard to, you know, you, you kind of get it, but it's hard to put it into words. Um, but I think as we work through these sentences, as we, as we look at the cases above, then I, I think most of them should, should make some sense. Now you notice that in this case, we have not, uh, we didn't have any examples from the genitive or from the dative, um, but we'll, we'll see those as we go. Okay, so we'll stop this video here. Take care.